shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. And then shall the end come. Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Here's today's prophecy update. A year and a half after surviving an assassination attempt and being told he may never walk again, Yehuda Glick strode on stage in the Israeli Knesset on Monday and was sworn in as a member. The new MK was shot four times in the chest in November of 2014 by Mutaz Hijazi, an Arab man from Jerusalem who called Glick an enemy of Al-Aqsa. Glick was undeterred from his work to allow Jews to pray at Judaism's holiest site and vowed to continue it in the Knesset. As long as I am here, I will do all I can to stop the injustice taking place every day in the holiest place in the world where police officers are commanded to check if a 90-year-old Jew moves his lips or not, Glick said. Glick's entrance into the Israeli Knesset is especially interesting since the Bible prophesies that a Jewish temple will be built on the Temple Mount at some time in the future. That time may be just closer than any of us think. Well, frankly, I never knew whether I would see this development or not. Now, Mr. Yehuda Glick is a personal friend of mine. He's been to our hotel to speak to our group several different times. And to see him as an official member of the Israeli government is astounding to me. You see, Glick is the leading advocate, the leading advocate of the right for Jews to pray on the Temple Mount and for the rebuilding of Israel's third temple. He went on something like a 50 some day fast because of the Temple Mount. And this man who was sort of considered a maverick has nevertheless, through his relentless pursuit, now found his way into the Israeli Knesset where he is a member of the government now in charge of the nation of Israel. What does it all mean? Well, here's what we know for sure. The Bible prophesies there will be a temple built on the Temple Mount and that Jews will be allowed to worship there. Revelation chapter number 11, verse 1 and 2. John was told to take a measuring reed and to measure the temple and those that worship therein. Now you can't measure a temple if there's no temple to measure. The setting for this prophecy is three and a half years before the battle of Armageddon and the second coming of Jesus to this earth. So he's told to measure the temple and the worshipers therein, but then he was also told, do not measure the outer court because it will be trodden down on the Gentiles for 42 months. That's the way we know the amount of time between the occurrence of this prophecy and the culmination of everything at the battle of Armageddon. So here we have a specific prophecy. There is going to be a temple built on the Temple Mount and Jewish people will worship there. The prophecy also states that the Temple Mount will be shared. Now, Yehuda Glick is promoting exactly that arrangement. He is promoting in the Israeli Knesset as of Monday when he was sworn in, he is promoting exactly what the prophecy says, but he is not a believer in the New Testament. He is merely pushing what he believes is the right thing 
for Israel to do. So as we see this unfolding in front of us, ladies and gentlemen, can anyone write this off as coincidental? This prophecy was given 2,000 years ago, and here we are watching it unfold in detail. The prophecy does not say that Israel is going to control all the Temple Mount. The prophecy says a Jewish temple will be built there. Israel has not had a temple for 2,000 years. Think of that. And only a nation since 1948. So here we are, 60, what, 67 years later. It's absolutely amazing that we are watching the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And oh, by the way, the rebirth of the nation of Israel is laid out in detail in Ezekiel chapter 37 plus other prophecies as well. So Almighty God foretold that Israel would be exiled away from her homeland, but then brought back. There even appears to be a prophecy that says the exile would last 2,000 years, and that's about what it did last, in fact. So here the Bible is giving us, in all this detail, these things that are coming. You and I now are watching it happen in front of our eyes. You may say, well, do we really know there's going to be a temple built there soon? Yes, we do. The Bible says it's going to happen. But what are current events telling us? How close are we really to such an event? Now, there are two nations that are the prime movers on the Temple Mount, Israel and Jordan. There's been a lot of conflict over the Temple Mount by Muslims, particularly radical Muslims. But the final say takes place between Jordan and Israel. Both Prime Minister Netanyahu and King Abdullah of Jordan know that this someday will have to be resolved. I have read articles, speeches made by Netanyahu where he has referred to the need to postpone the resolution of this problem until a final solution, a final peace agreement is reached. But Jordan and Israel are moving together. An article just appeared within the last few days that there are now 500 Jordanians working every day in Eilat, which is in Israel, in southern Jordan. They come over and they work there every day. They're hoping to up that number to 1,500 soon. In addition to that, they have now contracted, they already have the bids out, on a bridge in northern Israel, in northern Jordan, that will bring the two nations together. They already have several crossing points, but they're hoping someday to abolish the border completely. I don't know whether that day will come or not, but there definitely is a, an improvement of relations. They also have agreed to work together as a joint project to build a canal from the Red Sea in the south up to the Dead Sea. This would produce a flow of water from the Red Sea to the Dead Sea because the Dead Sea is going down, down, down. It's already dropped like 30 feet over the last number of years. I believe it's dropping somewhere around a yard per year. So it's going down. They don't want the Dead Sea to ultimately disappear. So they thought, you know what we could do since the Red Sea is tapped into international waters and it wouldn't even make a dent in the Red Sea because it's hooked up to the Persian Gulf and through the Suez Canal, it's also uh, hooked up to the Atlantic Ocean. Therefore, uh, if we had this canal, we would have an unlimited source of water. We could bring the Dead Sea back to whatever level we would choose to bring it back up to. And there are other benefits to this as well because as the water flows from the Red Sea to the Dead Sea, we will install turbines to create electricity along the way. So it's going to create electricity. We're going to build a salination plant there. 
and that will produce a very high level of pure water for southern Israel, which is where one of Israel's greatest needs is. At the same time, Jordan needs water, water up in the north, so we'll give Jordan some water out of the Sea of Galilee, whereas we get this water from down here from this desalination plant. I mean, that's how much Israel and Jordan are cooperating together. And I would remind you, the Bible specifically prophesies two nations that will never fall under the power of the Antichrist. Jordan, Israel. In Daniel chapter number 11, verse number 41, the Bible prophesies that Edom, Moab, and Ammon shall escape out of the hand of the Antichrist. That's Daniel 11, 41. Edom is southern Jordan, the area called Petra. The Moab Mountains are in central Jordan, which is what they're called to this day. I see them every, every time I go to Israel. And then Amman, Jordan is the capital of Jordan, just 40 miles away from Jerusalem. So here we are. This prophecy tells us that Jordan is never going to fall under the power of the Antichrist. And then the Bible teaches that Israel is never going to fall under the power of the Antichrist. In Re Revelation chapter number 12, verse number 13 and 14, it states that the Antichrist will launch an effort to invade Israel to persecute the Jewish people, but the Bible says the Jewish people will be protected by the wings of a great eagle, speaking of the United States of America, and they will be nourished and protected for time, times, and half a time, which is three and a half years. Remember the prophecy of Revelation 11, verse 1 and 2 is for 42 months, which is three and a half years. So we have all these prophecies that are affecting this era of time. And the Bible tells us that Israel will be protected from the Antichrist all during the great tribulation period. This period of three and one half years foretold several places in the Bible. So Jordan is never going to be occupied by the Antichrist. Israel is never going to be occupied by the Antichrist until the battle of Armageddon. Only at the battle of Armageddon, Zechariah 14, 2 tells us that all nations will come against Jerusalem to battle at that time. You obviously do not try to occupy a place if you already control it, which is conclusive proof that Israel will continue to be protected all during the Great Tribulation inside of her promised land. Well, when we see all these things coming together, it's almost enough to make your hair stand on in and you realize that there is a God who is orchestrating everything. He foresaw long ago and put it in the prophecies of the Bible. The prophecy about Jordan never being under the power of the Antichrist is 2,500 years old. The prophecy about the Temple Mount being shared is 2,000 years old. And yet we're watching, you and me, are watching these things come to pass right now. What does this mean to us? The Bible tells us that there will be a generation that will see certain prophetic fulfillments. And the generation that sees these prophetic fulfillments will not pass until everything is fulfilled, including the second coming of Jesus. Jesus actually gave that prophecy in his famous discourse called the Olivet Discourse. It's Matthew chapter number 24. And a lot of people have misunderstood the prophecy. They say, well, when Israel was declared a nation in 1948, that meant the generation that saw Israel reborn would not pass until everything was fulfilled. But that's not what the prophecy says. If you want to understand how to recognize the generation that will not pass until everything is wrapped up. The one that Jesus was speaking about there in Matthew 24, verse 32 through 36. We have a DVD out. It's called, This Generation Shall Not Pass. And we tell you in this DVD how you will recognize the generation that will not pass. Now, the two things that the Bible specifically says will happen and will give us absolute recognition that we are the generation that will not pass until everything is wrapped up, those two things haven't happened yet, 
but they're on the brink of happening. The table's being set for them right now. What incredible days you and I live in. The Bible says that, uh, well, there will be a generation, the generation upon whom the ends of the world have come. If you would like to have your own copy of This Generation Shall Not Pass, call us. The number to call is 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463. And just ask for This Generation Shall Not Pass. Our operators are right there and be glad to send that to you. If you've never been through that prophecy, you need to go through it. Uh, That's not part of our 14 lesson series. Of course, you need to get the 14 lesson series called Understand the End Time as well. But When you get that series, make sure you also get This Generation Shall Not Pass. It's so absolutely fascinating as we watch everything coming together. Let me tell you a little bit more about Yehuda Glick. I first heard about him in some of his efforts that he has made for the rebuilding of the temple on the Temple Mount. Now, at first he was considered the radical of all radicals. Little by little, though, he has said in very gentlemanly terms, look, we have a right to pray there. Everybody knows, the world knows, it's the location of our first temple, our second temple. 37 times in the Old Testament, God said, I'm gonna put my name there on the Temple Mount. I will meet you there, that's where my presence will meet you. So the world knows that, and yet, the world is afraid to upset the Arabs who don't want the Jews to pray there. Now, how do things stand right now? Right now, the Temple Mount is under the control of the Arab Waqf. Now, the ultimate control is Israel. If some riot breaks out there, the Israeli police come in and put down the riot and banish the rioters, at least until tomorrow. So that's the way things are right now. The Muslim Waqf, is the religious organization that administers the daily activities on the Temple Mount. The Muslim walk is paid by the government of Jordan. Well, the Muslim walk, they allow visitors to come up between certain hours onto the Temple Mount. However, they hold a, a line that no one except Muslims can pray on the Temple Mount. They claim the whole place is a mosque and therefore Muslims cannot pray there. Muslims cannot worship there. I mean, whoa, I said that wrong. Non-Muslims cannot pray there. They cannot worship there. And if they do, they are immediately arrested and escorted off the Temple Mount. And what happens is, especially when Jews go up there, they'll follow them. They'll follow them everywhere they go and they'll watch them. If they feel like they move their lips to pray, then immediately they are arrested and carried off. Now, this is territory that Israel captured, which belonged to no one prior to 1967. The Jordanians had invaded this territory in the 48 war. They came over to try to destroy the nation of Israel at its birth when there were only 600,000 Jews in the entire Israeli nation, they came to try to destroy Israel. Well, God intervened, Israel survived, and the Jordanians, when the ceasefire was declared, they were in control of what's called Judea Samaria, which commonly is referred to in the newspapers as the West Bank. They control that, including East Jerusalem, which includes the Temple Mount. So they had control of this from 1949 until 1967. Now remember, they're the ones that started this war. They attacked Israel. Before this, the Jordanians were across the Jordan River. They weren't in the West Bank. They were not in East Jerusalem. This was part of the British mandate. That was non-state territory. It was that territory Uh, under the Ottoman Empire prior to World War I. Well, when World War I happened, then the Ottoman Empire was defeated and it became part of what was called the British Mandate. Well, the British were trying to solve the conflict because there was a big dispute between the Jews and the Arabs. The Jews are coming from all over the world because six million of them had just perished in the horrible Hitler's Holocaust. 
and they now desperately wanted a homeland. Plus, it was prophesied in the Bible that this would happen. So now here they come from everywhere. And during much of this time, there were more Jews than Arabs in this territory, but they all lived together. And much of the land was not occupied. It was desert land. And so people would pretty well set up their homes wherever they could find bare ground. Well, that happened from uh, 1917 until 1947. Well, 1947, the United Nations wanted to solve this dispute between the Arabs and the Jews over the land of Palestine, also the land called the Promised Land. And so they wanted to settle it. So they passed a resolution on November the 29th of 1947 creating an Israeli homeland and an Arab homeland in the British Mandate territories. Well, Israel was so happy to finally have a place to call home after 2,000 years of being nomads sifted through the nations that they accepted, even though the territory they were allotted was not even 25% of the biblical promised land, but still they accepted. They were just glad to have a place to call home where they would not be persecuted, where they would not be uh, driven to concentration camps, would not be put into crematoriums, would not be pushed into the gas chambers. So they accepted. The Arabs said to the United Nations, no, thank you, we're not interested. So they turned down their homeland, which also would have been on the territory that's the biblical promised land. Instead, the day Israel announced its independence on May the 14th of 1948, five Arab nations launched a war to try to destroy the nation of Israel because they hated the Jews. I mean, they had sided with the Germans during World War II and they had rooted for Adolf Hitler to totally wipe out the Jewish people from off the face of the earth. So now they're going to try to finish what Adolf Hitler was unsuccessful in finishing. They moved in and began to make war. I remember the Jews only had 600,000 people. And these five nations represented about 42 million people. It was really lopsided odds. It was truly David versus Goliath. And so they moved in and began to fight against the fledgling Jewish nation. But to the world's amazement, the Jewish people not only held their own and survived, but they actually expanded the amount of territory that they held. Now, when the ceasefire lines were drawn, the armistice said, these will not be permanent borders. These are just borders until permanent borders can be negotiated. Well, now then, the Palestinians are trying to say, oh, those are permanent borders. You've got to withdraw to 67 borders because that's where Israel stayed until the 67 war. Okay, so pulling all this together, the one thing that was under Jordanian control was the Temple Mount. The Jews still could not go to the side of their first and second temple and pray there until the 67 war. When the 67 war broke out, the Israeli government contacted King Hussein of Jordan and said, we have nothing against you. We will not bother you. Now remember, there's a fence down through the middle of Jerusalem. Jordanians are on one side, Jews are on the other. So the Israelis say to Jordan, we won't bother you if you'll stay out of the war. We have nothing against you. Well, Jordan didn't feel like they could stand aside while their Arab brethren were fighting against the hated Zionist entity. So they attacked Israel. Well, Israel counterattacked. Now they attacked Israel from territory that was not theirs, territory they had taken illegally back in the 48-49 war. So they attacked Israel now in an attempt to destroy the Jewish nation again. Israel counterattacked swept all the way the Jordan River, drove Jordanians back home. Didn't invade Jordan, but drove them back out of the territory that they had occupied 18 or 19 years before. And Israel captured the Temple Mount. Okay, now watch what happens next. Israel, trying to be magnanimous and kind when the ceasefire was declared, 
shortly invited the Arabs to come back and to oversee their holy places because the Jewish people felt like they should honor the holy places of other religions. Now, that's not what the Bible told them to do. The Bible says, when I bring you into the land that I have promised to your father Abraham, you are to occupy the land and utterly drive out the inhabitants thereof. But the people run the Jewish government at the time were not Bible-believing people. They were largely secular Jewish people, some of them total atheists. So they invited the Jordanians to send over the religious waqf to administer the holy places. Now, there were many Jews who were incredibly upset by this decision because they believed that this was the war of redemption. God had delivered the Temple Mount into their hands. So they wanted to immediately bulldoze the Dome of the Rock and the al Mosque and rebuild their temple. But their government said no. So that produced the present situation we have. It was out of the goodness of the heart of Israel. But now the Arabs turn and boldly say, oh, you can't even pray here. And they wouldn't even be there had it not been for the goodwill of the Jewish people. Nevertheless, you don't deal with the Muslims on the basis of goodwill. They don't understand that. They only understand brute force. Well, let me remind you once again of the DVD, This Generation Shall Not Pass. There's a generation, and I believe that you and I are a part of it, and you'll see on this tape why I believe you and I are the generation that will welcome back the second coming of Jesus. There's a generation that's coming, and I believe it's now. If you want to know that generation and know how to identify it for sure, just give us a call. The number to call is 800-END-TIME, 1-800-363-8463. Ask for the DVD, This Generation Shall Not Pass. When current events are found in Bible prophecy, it's astonishing. At End Time Ministries, we are seeing them unfold every day, and so can you. We've put together a current events in Bible prophecy package for anyone who wants to understand like never before. Irvin Baxter and his dedicated staff have spent hundreds of hours of research and study, and in doing so have discovered that current events in Bible prophecy are telling the same story. These 13 DVDs will prepare you to be ready in this extraordinary time that God has destined you to live. Call 1-800-END-TIME or go to endtime.com and save over 20% when you buy the current events in Bible Prophecy Package. All my life, I have heard the statement, nobody's perfect. But one day, Hebrews 10, 14 caught my attention. It says, for by one offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. I attempted to reconcile this statement with what I had viewed as the many imperfections in myself. Could it be that there are human beings on this earth that God considers perfect? In You Are Perfect, Urban Baxter explains what it means to be sanctified and why God sees those that are sanctified as perfect. This teaching has given people peace and security in their walk with God because of new understanding of how God sees them. This lesson is available on DVD, CD, in printed format, or even digital download to tell you not what's wrong with you, but what's right with you. You are perfect. Call 1-800-END-TIME or go to endtime.com to get yours today. If your radio station only carries the first 30 minutes of End of the Age, go to endtime.com to continue to listen to today's broadcast. We are taking your calls on the program today. The number to call to be on the air with me, 877-END-TIME. That's 877-END-T-I-M-E, 877-363-8463. To reach our operators, to become a partner, or to get the DVD that we've been advertising today, that number is 800-END-TIME. So 877-END-TIME to be on the air with me, 800-END-TIME to reach our operators. And we're talking today about the swearing-in of Yehuda Glick, Israel's number one proponent of the rebuilding of the Third Temple and of reestablishing Jewish worship on the Temple Mount. 
he this week was sworn in to the Israeli Knesset. Let me give you a little bit more of what Glick had to say. He said, I will not allow a global center of peace, goodness, and light to continue to be used as a center for incitement to terrorism. Now, remember, he was shot in the name of the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and he's referring to the Temple Mount, which the Muslims call the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Glick commended Public Security Minister Gilad Erdan and Justice Minister Ilat Shaked for working to remove inciting factors from the mound and said that as a result, this Passover just passed. A record number of Jews visited the site. More than 1,000 Jews in one week. Wow. Where did we hear that? I never heard about that. Kept pretty quiet, apparently. More than 1,000 Jews in one week, and yet things remained peaceful on the Temple Mount. Looks like things are moving. It turns out that the responsibility for violence is on the violent people and not the victims of violence. Glick said, a pointed response to those who call him a provocateur. So they say he provokes violence just because he goes on to the Temple Mount. Well, he took his seat in the Israeli Knesset this week. It's going to be interesting to watch it all play out. Okay, I gotta tell you, the announcement now is being made that Donald Trump has topped the 1,237 mark in delegate count, which means he has the votes necessary to become the Republican nominee. It looks like it's a locked up deal. Now, why is this important to anything we're talking about today? Well, this is a dramatic, unexpected turn of events. I mean, think about it. Here's a 69-year-old businessman, never in politics, um, a man who ran a television show, and all of a sudden he comes along, declares for the presidency, defeats 16 opponents, many of them well, well known. I'm talking about Jeb Bush. I'm talking about, uh, well, you know the list. But we're talking about people who are well known in the Republican establishment, but he defeats them all. And as of today, he is the Republican nominee. Now, what does that have to do with what's going on in Israel. We've got to understand that Israel is being accused of being an apartheid state because they want to be a Jewish state. They want to have a place that they know Jews will be safe. Well, we live in the time when the word racist is one of the worst names you can be called. You're much better to be called an adulterer or a drug addict, but if you're called racist, that's the worst thing you can be called. And you can be called racist if you don't want an increasing Muslim presence in America. If you believe that America's Judeo-Christian heritage is necessary and our Judeo-Christian culture is necessary for our form of government to work, if you believe that, Mr. Obama would call you a racist, as will many others. And if you believe in enforcing borders, you're considered a racist because John Kerry recently said when speaking at one of the graduation ceremonies, he said, students, you are entering a borderless world. Well, I thought we had borders here in the United States. I thought we had immigration laws, and we do, of course. But Mr. Kerry and Mr. Obama have choose, chosen to ignore them. And they've also chosen to do the same thing in Europe. And 
Angela Merkel, the head of Germany, let the cat out of the bag. She said, well, this is just one of the prices we pay for globalization. So what is globalization? It's the abolishment of all the borders. It's, it's the establishment of a borderless world where anybody can live anywhere they want to at any time. It's the dis destroying of nationhood and the establishment of a one world governmental system. They thought they were ready for this to happen. And it's working in most places in the world, but there are people who are rebelling against it and Donald Trump is leading this rebellion. He says he's gonna build a wall because if you don't have a border, you don't have a country. And of course he's right. What is not being said is, President Obama doesn't want us to have a country. Hillary Clinton does not want us to have a country. John Kerry does not want us to have a country. They want us to have a new world order. Strobe Talbot said it this way. He said in the 21st century, national sovereignty as we have known it will cease to exist. We'll all answer to a single global authority. Now that's the, that's the agenda. That's the big plan. And the world's moving toward it and they're going to for the most part, achieve it. But there will be those who are opponents to this plan. Among those will be Israel, Jordan, and the United States of America. When we see the nations that are specifically named in Daniel chapter 7 that will be on the earth at the time of the second coming of Jesus, when we see those nations merge into one nation in Revelation chapter 13, the United States is represented in Daniel 7 as the eagle's wings, but when we move to Revelation 13, when they move into a one world government system, the eagle's wings are not included. Russia's included, Britain's included, Germany's included, the European Union is included, but no United States. Apparently we have awakened. So it looks like we may in fact be watching this particular prophecy being fulfilled in this present election process. And it seems so unlikely that a man who is not a professional politician, uh, he is sometimes brash and crude. He's smart. He knows what's going on in the world. He's not been brainwashed by the political correctness and the American people have been waiting for someone to break the stranglehold of the establishment because all of us have sensed for the last 30 or 40 years that we've been voting for Tweedly D or Tweedly Dumb. And it's true. The same money people control both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. That's the reason we may get cosmetic change when we change from Democrat to Republican or from Republican to Democrat, but they've all been pursuing this policy of globalism. You know, after the Berlin Wall fell, all of us were told, you must now think globally. And everybody smiled benignly, wanting to be politically correct and say, okay, we must think globally. All the big corporations had meetings, brought their leadership in, explained we must now think globally. Uh, everybody, all the nations began to talk about globalization and how we now live in a global world and the internet has brought us all together and air travel has brought us all together and therefore borders are a thing that is obsolete. So we've been working toward the new world order. George Herbert Walker Bush actually declared it uh, shortly after the Berlin Wall fell. He said, we have a real chance at this new world order where the United Nations is able to play the role for which it was originally designed. And he was meaning for a one world government. Now they don't call it world government because they know there's still a lot of resistance to world government. But what they do call it is the international community or the world community. And they have world structures to get us used to it, such as world court, world trade organization, world health organization, world bank, international monetary fund, and on and on and on it goes. They have established all these international organizations and they're trying to drive us into this new world order. But all of a sudden here comes this brash, irreverent 
candidate who doesn't believe in the new world order. He even talks openly about they're trying to drive us into this new globalism where we will no longer have a country. We will all come under the auspices of international law. What's international law? Well, international law is the law of the world government that supersedes national law. That's what they want it to be. However, now it looks like the United States may be turning and running from this world governmental system. That's where we find ourselves. And you might like to know that the Bible prophesies the United States is not going to end up being a part of this world government and you and me should be cheering at the top of our voice. Okay, now, I'm not really so much interested in the political side of this as I am the spiritual side. Because the Bible prophesies for the days ahead that not only is there going to be a world government, but there's going to be a world spiritualism, a world religious system, if you please. Because they know that politics brings people together. But there's one thing that even supersedes politics, and that's religion. They've gone into Iraq and tried to, to nation build. They found out, though, that until you change the religion, as soon as you take your troops out, they go right back to where they were. And of course, that's what's happened in Iraq and throughout the Middle East. What we thought would work, we underestimated the power of religious belief. Well, they're going to learn their lesson this time. And they're going to mandate that the whole world adopt a certain form of belief. The Bible teaches that all the world will be forced to worship the Antichrist and his one world governmental system. And if you don't, you're going to be frozen out of the economy. The Bible says every person will have to have a mark or a number without which they cannot buy or sell. And in order to get your mark or number, you must worship the Antichrist. That'll probably be in the form of a, a, a pledge of allegiance or something of that nature. Now, what's going to happen is, is all this is coming together, and by the way, it's coming together. Here's what I envision. Jordan, Israel, United States are going to be resistors, maybe with some other nations that we don't know the names of right now. But we know those three, I believe for sure. As resistors, will we then be the only place of safety from this global dictatorship called the New World Order? I believe we will be. America has a pivotal role to play. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm so happy we do. Let's do it together. We'll be back in just a moment. One day I was listening to End of the Age, much like you are now, when a commercial came on about the Salvation Package. It's a set of four DVDs in which Irvin teaches about topics like Nicodemus' question to Jesus, what must I do to be born again? I remember Irvin said in the commercial, if you don't love the truth, don't get this because it will make you mad. Well, I was hungry for the truth, so I did get it, and I am so glad I did. I'd been studying the Bible for many years, but learned there was more in the scriptures about what it means to be born again. When the disciples came to Jesus and asked, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Jesus said, take heed of false teaching, for many will come in my name and deceive many. Now I know what Jesus was talking about when he made that statement, and I won't be deceived. The salvation package changed my life and my eternity. I'm so thankful for that commercial I heard. That's why today I wanted to record one too, for someone out there listening, searching for the truth. You'll find it in the salvation package. Get the four DVD set for $65 or the individual DVDs for $20 each. We are taking your calls today on End of the Age. The number to call to be on the air with me, 877 End Time. Uh, let me pause just a moment to tell you about our End Time Prophecy Tour coming up October 27th through November the 7th. It's a 12-day tour. 
And this is a great length of tour. You know, you're gonna pay for the airfare all the way over there and back. So it doesn't take much more. I, I hear about these eight day tours and I just cringe because I've been going to Israel every year since 1993 and I understand what's involved. Well, you travel a day and a half over there and then you got to get over the jet lag. So you've lost two days there and then you travel a day and a half to get back. So on an eight day tour, you may tour four days and you've paid all that money for a very quick whirlwind tour and you miss so much. Well, on this 12 day tour, you get about nine days of solid touring and we really do cover the nation of Israel. Uh, we don't cover everything, of course, that would be impossible in 15 days, but on our tour, you're gonna really enjoy it. So if you've been wanting to go to Israel, now is a wonderful time. Oh, by the way, the tension has been reduced. Things are getting better now. There are things going on behind the scenes. There are peace talks in progress. So we never had any problem when we were there uh, in the spring, everything is fine. We've, we've been every fall, every spring for the last several years. Matter of fact, we've never missed a year. A lot of times you hear about how tough things are and then you go over there and there's nothing. Because what happens is the news media, in order to grab attention, they will find the absolute worst incident they can get their fingers on so that everybody will realize how dramatic all this is. When the truth of the matter is, you know, you can have a rock throwing by two 10 year old kids in Israel and it will get world headlines and you can have a triple murder in New York and you never even know what happened. Do you realize that during this whole last five or six months that there were about 30 Jews killed in a six month period? Do you realize that over 50 per week are being killed in Chicago right now? in one city in the United States, and yet they scare you about going to Israel. Well, it's ridiculous. Uh, I have never known of a fatality of any person on an organized tour. Now, if you go over there and freelance and don't know what you're doing or where you're going, you may get in trouble. But as far as uh, having any problem, I believe it's just as safe as being here in the United States of America. That's the reason I go every year. So I'm inviting you to go with Judy and I. It's going to be a, a wonderful tour. Uh, things are moving in Israel. You will stand on the Mount of Olives where Jesus will come back to, and you will stand on the Temple Mount where the third temple will soon be built. You'll stand there and see it. You'll stand right on the place and you will walk into the tomb where Je Jesus spent three days and three nights. Uh, you're going to go to Bethlehem where Jesus was born. You're gonna walk down through the Kidron Valley where the Battle of Armageddon will culminate. You're gonna stand in the plain of Megiddo where the Battle of Armageddon will begin. I mean, I cannot tell you how incredibly wonderful it is, especially if you go with someone that can give you the whole story. If you, there's a lot of good tours to Israel, but there are almost no tours that give you both sides of the story. You can get the history and all about Jesus being there. And of course, that's precious to all of us, but we, we give you both sides. We give you not only what has happened, but what's happening now and what is going to happen. We will unveil the prophecies of the Bible to you on site. It is an unprecedented experience and that's to say nothing of our boat ride across the Sea of Galilee, which is always a highlight, plus the Jordan River. Wow, the baptism of the Jordan River. We always have an incredible time. It's gonna be a great tour. People are already signing up already. I wouldn't wait too long. The number to call is 1-800-END-TIME. Ask to speak to someone about the tour. The number is 1-800-END-TIME. They'll send you out the brochure, answer your questions so that you can make your decision. By the way, this is open line. For some reason, no, the phones are not ringing today, uh, but I'm here and the number is 877-END-TIME to be on the air with me. Uh, let me tell you about something else that has just happened at the United Nations. Uh, this little article appeared in Israel National News. Arabs are angered by UN exhibit calling Jerusalem Israel's capital. Arab and Islamic nations are demanding that the United Nations remove a panel 
from an Israeli exhibition at the UN that calls Jerusalem the spiritual and physical capital of the Jewish people, the Associated Press reported last Friday. The exhibition in a corridor near a popular cafe in the UN basement includes panels on Israel's Arabs, its technology, innovations, and other aspects of Israeli life, according to the news agency. Now then the Arabs say, oh, no, 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 don't put there that Jerusalem is Israel's capital because they intend it for it to be their capital. And by the way, that's also an issue in the present political campaign. Donald Trump has said, I will move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem if I am elected president. It's going to be very interesting. Not only did he make that statement, but also uh, Marco Rubio had made that promise as well as uh, other candidates, including Ted Cruz. He said he would make that commitment as well. So uh, that's something that's coming at us very quickly. By the way, a week from tomorrow, eight days from today, Nations are going to be converging on Paris, France. They're opening a summit to try to hammer out the paradigms for a Middle East peace agreement. If they're able to agree, and by the way the United States is going there, then they hope to present this at an international conference later on the summer, preparing for a resolution that would then be put before the United Nations that they would then pass, which would take on the force of international law. They're going to try to force a peace agreement yet this year, and they want to do it while Barack Obama is still in office because they think he will not veto it. And the fact that John Kerry is going to this meeting indicates perhaps the Obama administration would not veto it, and they'll try to force Israel to do what the international community, the world government, says that Israel should do. That's a week from tomorrow that begins. Let's now go to the phones. Uh, Brock is calling, or no, it's Brooke. Brooke is calling from Oklahoma. Hello, Brooke. Hello, I have a off the wall question. I'd always wondered, I know that in the thousand year reign that there's not gonna be killings and things like that. So would that mean that the people living during that time frame would be vegetarian? Uh, it appears that we definitely eat fish during the millennial reign. I do not know whether that means the people would be very vegetarian or not. Uh, we know that originally God said that all meat is good for food if it's received with thanksgiving. So I don't have any indication in the Bible that there will be, and the Bible does say that the uh, bear will eat straw like the cow. So the bear is going to become a vegetarian. It may well be that the human beings left on here on earth. I guess that's one reason I want to make sure I make the rapture because I really like ribeye steak really well. So, uh, but it, it could be true. Okay, it was just a question I was just kind of thought off the top of my head, but thank you. Yeah, well, you're most welcome. Thank you very much. Um, you know, when Brooke refers to the millennial reign, the word millennial, the word milli is for 1,000. And the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ and his church will rule this world for 1,000 years. Now, at that time, we're going to be immortal. If when Jesus comes back, you are born again, living for Jesus Christ, the Bible teaches that at the time of his coming, you will be changed from mortal to immortality. We're talking about the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. He came forth immortal. He was able to appear, to disappear. He was no longer bound by the laws of space and time. He could be one place and instantaneously be another place. Well, that's the way you and I are going to be during the millennium. And the Bible teaches that we will rule and reign as kings and priests with Jesus Christ. So it's going to be mortals, immortals ruling over mortals. Uh, there will be a thousand years here on earth, and then things are going to be the way God originally intended for the world to be. We're going to see the world as God intended for it to be in the beginning before sin entered the human race. It's going to be a wonderful time. And how close is it? Oh, don't worry about it. It's at least eight years away, maybe nine, maybe 10, maybe 11. 
I don't think it's much further than that, though. I mean, you and I live in the most exciting, amazing, wonderful times ever. I'm going back to the phone now. Uh, Gary is calling from right here in Texas. Hello, Gary. Oh, hello. Yes, thank you. I was adjusting my volume. Um, I was wondering about the electromagnetic pulse detonation. Uh, if we were ever to uh, experience that, how that might play into the end time uh, scenario where we're not part of the uh, one world government. Can you comment on that, please? Yeah, to make sure all of our listeners understand EMP, that stands for Electronic Magnetic Pulse uh, Weapon. And what that is, uh, is an atom bomb exploded, a nuclear bomb exploded like 300 miles in the air. It then sends out an electronic magnetic pulse and it fries the um, mechanisms, the wiring of computers, of engines, and supposedly would paralyze a nation. Now, I'm not an expert on electronic magnetic pulse. I have read quite a number of articles on it, but supposedly it would toss us back into the 1800s somewhere before the days of electricity because all the wires and everything would be fried. Uh, Will America be hit by that? The Bible doesn't say for sure. Here's what we know. During this war that's coming, according to Revelation 9, verse number 13 through 21, there's going to be a killing of one third of mankind. I will be surprised if there's not the use of electronic magnetic pulse weapons by someone. However, before a person pulls the trigger on that, they better be ready because the same people they're attacking with those weapons have those weapons. And so that would undoubtedly be reversed. So I, I cannot tell you whether that's going to happen. Here's what we know. We know that 2.4 billion people are going to die. It may well happen in some parts of the world. Do we have the adequate anti-missile defense systems to counteract it? I don't know the answer to that. Um, but this we do know, that this war is going to happen. We do know that America is going to survive because we're protecting Israel during the time of the Great Tribulation, which comes after that. So uh, I can't answer your question fully, Gary, because I don't really know whether that will happen or not. But obviously, it would throw the world into a level of chaos that would certainly call for a new world order and for a one world governmental system to take over everything. And, and that's really what's going to happen. Well, listen, our time has come and gone. One more Thank time, you. let me remind you about the DVD, This Generation Shall Not Pass. And also, if you're interested in the tour, going to Israel with Judy Nye in October, the number to call is 1-800-IN-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463. God bless you all. See you tomorrow. is a production of End Time Ministries. This broadcast will be available on our website, endtime.com, in the archive section. On our website, you'll also find more information about how current events are fulfilling Bible prophecy. To reach our operators, call 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463. End Time Ministries is partner-supported. We would like to say thank you to our partners who made this broadcast possible. To do what Matthew 24, 14 said, to reach the world with the gospel of the kingdom.